All right, let's get started with this online lecture on uh, compression members and reinforced concrete design. Just a few quick announcements. Uh, homework 8 uh, on development link is due on Monday, and then you'll get assigned homework 9 uh, the following Monday, uh, and that'll be due on uh, April 27th, the Friday before uh, uh, the exam. Exams on uh, Monday, April 30th. We'll have our exam review on the 27th. Um, uh, this lecture is primarily intended for to supplement uh, our canceled lecture on Friday. So this is the short video uh, that will be posted on compression members. And this will be a fairly short video. It's really just uh, intended to overview, give you an overview of the ACI provisions for columns. Uh, when we come back to class on Monday, we'll employ these directly for the purposes uh, of analysis and design. So let me go back. Uh, in our uh, presentation and oops, sorry go back in our presentation and let's uh, look at compression members uh, and let's look at the capacity um, like I said uh, in class uh, today we're going to start off uh, our discussion of compression members by looking at compression members that are subjected only to axial load uh, we call those columns and that if you ever have an element that's subjected to axial load and bending in other words, a column that's meant to resist lateral forces such as wind and seismic, um, that would be a, uh, what we call a beam column. Um, we're also, so we're going to start um, <coughs> with no bending. We'll handle bending later. And we're also going to neglect the effects of buckling. We will uh, discuss those effects in significant detail, uh, hopefully in the last week of the semester, depending upon time. That's, that's sort of the plan uh, near the end. For short columns, uh, we limit the stress to 0.85 FC prime in concrete. So the, actually, the, com the computation of a, of a column's capacity is pretty simple. Uh, again, whenever I use the term short column, we're talking about columns where we're neglecting the effects of buckling. We can handle the effects of buckling uh, later, uh, and we call those long columns. So if you ever hear the term short column or long column, that's basically the difference. With short columns, we neglect uh, buckling. Um, Another point that's worth mentioning uh, is the difference between square columns and circular columns. While it's not explicitly defined this way, typically square columns use equally spaced ties uh, of reinforce of transverse reinforcement, and circular columns use spiral reinforcements. Now, it's not an always and never scenario. I mean, you could use ties with circular columns uh, uh, if you wanted, but primarily square columns you tend to use ties, and circular columns you tend to use uh, spirals. Um, square columns, the main idea is that the ties are meant to hold together the longitudinal bars when you're placing the, uh, uh, the columns in during construction. So the idea is you would uh, erect your um, forms, you would erect your uh, uh, longitudinal rebar inside the column, hold that rebar together with those, uh, those ties, those transverse ties, and then uh, place your concrete. Those ties are also intended to prevent the longitudinal bars from buckling after the cover spalls. Um, and I'll, I'll, I have a really good image uh, here later on that will sort of explicitly describe what's going on there. Because um, it sort of indicates a difference between how square columns behave and how circular columns behave. Circular columns are usually transversely reinforced with spiral uh, rebar. In other words, rebar spiraling up the, uh, the longitudinal axis of the column. And they're much more effective than ties in increasing the column strength. Now, the, the downside is they're a little more expensive. But it also depends on what you're using them for. Circular columns tend to get used uh, a lot more in seismic applications, so they're much better for those types of applications. Um, around here uh, in this area of the country, you're going to see square columns a lot more common when you have a, uh, a square surface to, uh, to work off of, and uh, it's sim a little simpler to, uh, to form up. Now, to compute the capacity of a column, it's actually really simple. You would compute the theoretical capacity. And like I said, the theoretical capacity of a, con uh, of a column we're taking is just Fy for the steel and 0.85 Fc prime for the concrete. So we take Fy times the area of the steel, that you see over there on the right uh, of that equation. And as for the left, we have 0.85 FC prime. That's times the quantity AG minus AST. That's basically just the gross area of the column minus the area of the steel. So for instance, if you had a square column that had you know, eight number nines, 
you take the area of that column minus the area of the steel, and then that would give you the, the area of the concrete. So it's just 0.85 times FC prime times the area of the concrete and FY times the area of the steel. Now that's the theoretical capacity. The code requires us to adjust that theoretical capacity for accidental eccentricity. The idea is that when you're computing the capacity of a column, you're assuming, uh, and, and you're uh, assuming axial load. You assume that that load is absolutely perfectly placed right along the, uh, the the centroid. And in real life, it's very possible that that load isn't squarely perfectly uh, in the center of that column, if you will. So the code requires us to reduce that theoretic that theoretical capacity a little bit to account for accidental eccentricity. Um, and there's a different value for tied columns and spiral columns. So we, we call that term alpha. Uh, so we take the theoretical capacity, we reduce it by alpha to get a nominal capacity. And then don't forget we have to throw in our uh, strength reduction factor B to get a design capacity. So the equation for the theoretical or for the design capacity of a column is as follows. We take that theoretical capacity, uh, 0.85 FC prime, uh, AGAST minus FYAST, we take that theoretical capacity, adjust it by phi, and adjust it by alpha. Now, uh, these phi values, because spiral column, the phi values and the, the alpha values, I should mention, because spiral columns tend to perform a little bit better, uh, in spiral columns, the, 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 because they perform better, the phi values and the alpha values are a little higher, 0.75 and 0.85. As for tied columns, uh, we, we use a 0.65 value for the strength reduction factor and an alpha value of 0.8. Now something I, I would actually, it's actually worth mentioning, if you look at the, the, um, the phi value of 0.65, I want to sort of illustrate where this particular value is coming from. I'm actually going to go up in the slides quite a bit. I'm going to go back to, let me see if I can find it. I'm actually going to go right. Here. No, let me see if I can find a better image of it. Let's see. Apologize for the delay. Ah, here we go. Perfect. Ignore that. All right. So, going back a little bit, this is the ACI strength reduction factor for beams. Uh, and if you recall for beams, more often than not, we're using a, a resistance factor of 0.9. But remember, for beams, it depended upon the strain in the steel. And if you were able to achieve a certain value of strain in the steel, particularly a strain value of 0 0.005, then you had a fee value of 0.9. But remember, that was tensile strain. In other words, you had to achieve a certain uh, degree of tension uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the beam or in, in the steel. Well, this is a column, and a column doesn't see any tension at all. It's nothing but pure compression. So in a column, the, the tensile strain would be zero. In fact, it would be negative. It'd be on the other end. So in that regard, that's where the phi value of 0.65 comes from for tied columns. I mean, if you think a tied square column it is really nothing more than a beam that's just being pushed on instead of being bent. So that's you can see it, it would definitely be a compression-controlled section because it's seeing nothing but compression. Uh, remember, when, when concrete elements fail in compression, they tend to fail quite suddenly and quite dramatically, so it would make sense that our strength reduction factor is so much smaller. For tied or spiral columns, because they perform a little bit better, we're able to bump that strength reduction factor up a little bit. Now, again, remember, in order to get that performance, we have to spend a little bit of money because the columns are a little more intricate and have a little bit more steel going on. Um, particularly and specifically for, if you see here my mouse pointer, for spiral columns, if you had a circular spiral column, this curve would sort of go down like this and then trail off, and then it would just trail off at, a, at 0.75. All right, let's see if I can find that slide I was looking at. It's 253. Yeah. Okay. So, like I said, here's our uh, equation to determine the design capacity of a uh, reinforced concrete column. All these uh, parameters are pretty easy to find. AST is just the area of steel reinforcement, so if you had eight number nine, so it'd just be eight square inches or something like that. And then the gross area, it's either, you know, D squared if it's a square column or pi D squared over four if it's a circular column. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, there are a few 
uh, sort of, it might seem like nitpicky uh, ACI requirements for, for cast-in-place columns. That's what the CIP stands for, just cast-in-place columns. But um, uh, I think you'll find they're pretty simple to check. You just have to go through and do them one by one. We'll, we'll have a, 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 a pretty thorough set of examples uh, on Monday to address this, but I want to take these one at a time. So if you remember, row is sort of our uh, uh, expression of the percentage of reinforcement. It's the area of steel divided by the, essentially the area of concrete. So our reinforcement ratio for the steel in, the, uh, in a column is basically limited to be between 1% uh, and 8%. Um, so when we design columns, you'll see that, that our reinforcement ratio is usually somewhere in between those two values. Uh, 2%, 3%, 4%, these are really, really common values for, um, uh, for reinforcement ratios. Um, if you've got a square column, um, or a particularly one with ties, um, you have to have at least four bars. You can't, have, you can't use three bars, so just, that's just something to be aware of. And if you're using a spiral column, you have to have at least six bars. So if you need a small amount of steel, you can use smaller bars, but you have to at least provide that number of bars. Now, this, this next uh, uh, bullet here is really not a, an ACI limit. It's just really in terms of practicality. Because of cover and tie size and bar spacing and even you know, aggregate size, you, know, you have to provide some uh, degree of distance between your, your bars in order to develop, uh, in order to get a good bond. A really a practical minimum column dimension is somewhere between 8 and 10 inches. So if you're ever doing the math and you have a column that has a really small load on it and you're getting you know, a, a smaller value, you, you have to bump that up for practicality. So really a practic practical minimum dimension somewhere there. Um, some other requirements. So uh, if you're looking at ties, um, uh, remember the ties are meant to hold the bars together. Let me skip ahead a slide. This is an image of some uh, uh, some square columns that are tra uh, have ties for transverse reinforcement. Remember, those ties are intended to hold the bars together during placement uh, of the concrete. So it really wouldn't make sense if you had a you know, like a massive number 18 bar and just a dinky little number three keeping everything tied together. So um, the minimum tie size is uh, sorry the minimum tie size for number three bars up to a number. Uh, up to a number 10 would be to use a number 3 bar. And any time that the bar size gets over uh, a number 10, you'd have to bump your tie size up to a number 4. So that's pretty simple. It's just something to, uh, uh, to make sure that you're, you're detailing appropriately. Now, as for tie spacing, we have minimums and maximums. The minimum tie spacing is either uh, an inch or a longitudinal bar diameter, whichever one's the biggest. And the maximum tie spacing is the smallest of 48 type tie bar diameters, 16 longitudinal bar diameters, or whatever the smallest column dimension is. A lot of times the, the smallest column dimension ends up governing. So if you have a column that's, let's say, 12 inches by 12 inches, you end up spacing your ties every 12 inches. And again, the idea is, you know, again, you want to use those ties to tie together the rebar during concrete placement. Well, if you had the ties spaced 12 feet apart, they really wouldn't be doing their job very well. Um, so you have to have those ties uh, space every so often. More often than not, you're, you're designing the column based off maximum tie spacing because you want to provide enough ties to hold the rebar together, but really that's it. You don't need any more and you're really, it's almost sort of throwing a money away, um, especially when you could use something like a circular column with spirals for, uh, uh, for seismic applications. Um, Additional requirements for cast-in-place columns, no longitudinal bar can be located more than six inches from another laterally supported bar, and that's just for bond and, and keeping everything uh, together during placement. So if you're you know, looking at your dimensions, basically what we're saying is that that clear distance between this bar and that bar, it's a maximum of six inches. So if you're ever in danger of violating that, um, you really are going to be looking at, uh, at really needing to reproportion the column. H however, more often than not, uh, at least what I found is this is a check that's never really uh, had, had a, a massive impact uh, on uh, my designs. Usually uh, the designs that I'm picking, tend to, this tends to not be a, a really major problem. I mean, it's something you need to check, but usually with proper design, uh, it's not that big of a deal. Um, 
Some other additional requirements for spiral columns. The spirals, I mean, they can't, I mean, this, this first bullet, you're basically saying the spirals have to have a diameter uh, three eighths inches or bigger, but that's basically saying that they need to be number three bars or uh, or larger. And usually, uh, uh, you know, you look at these bullets and they're kind of funny because the spirals have to have a diameter larger or three eighths inches or larger. And your clear spacing between the spirals has to be between one and three inches. So a very very common spiral design is number three bars or two inches. It, it's very very common, and we'll we'll tend to see that quite a bit. Um, we're going to do this problem uh, in class. I'm going to skip this because I want to show you uh, some additional provisions associated with um, the circular columns. And then when we come to class on Monday, we'll do example 18A and 18B back to back. But the idea with 18A is to try and define BPN, the design load axial, the, the design axial strength uh, of this column. So the actual computation of the design axial strength will take about 20 seconds. It'll be very, very fast. Um, but I'm going to also use this example as a means to go through all of the uh, the ACI provisions. And this is a very, very um, traditional and common set of um, of calculations. This is a pretty straightforward uh, uh, column problem that you would get um, uh, not only in this class but in, in uh, real world applications as well. I do want to show you what's going on with, with column failure. And th this is sort of what was being mentioned earlier that the ties, they are meant to hold the, um, the rebar together during placement, but they're also meant to sort of confine the column a little bit uh, during failure. So if you take a column, um, uh, and, and uh, particularly a tied column, and you start loading into compression, the first thing that will start to fail is the concrete on the outside. Um, you know, for instance, if we go back to, to this column here and you start loading it in compression, the first thing that'll fail is this, this concrete around the edge. And it'll sort of crack off, and the term that we use for that is called spalling. That, that concrete on the outside will spall off. And so what you'll see is this sort of core of concrete. You'll see these bars, uh, these longitudinal bars, the transverse bars, and then the core in the inside. And if you don't have adequate tie spacing uh, or, or what have you, those those longitudinal bars will begin to buckle, and and the column will start to go pretty quickly from there. Now, spiral columns act a little better. Spiral columns, you know, the co the concrete uh, all, along the outside will spall just like um, with a square or with a tied column, but with spiral columns, because you have so much spiral reinforcement, that core and the spirals it, it'll remain much more intact and a really good analogy is imagine if you had sort of like a uh, imagine like you had a syringe that didn't have a needle on it and I'm sure you've probably done something like this before but if you had something like that and you had the plunger on one side and you stopped the end and pressed the plunger you you, you know the air inside it's almost like you have like a pressure vessel and you can see you've got a lot of resistance and that's kind of what's happening um, uh, in this instance the core of that column, the concrete and the reinforcement contained within that, that, that inner region, it starts to accept a lot of the load and the, the spiral sort of acts like a confining pressure vessel containing uh, all of that, uh, uh, containing that core. So you get a little bit of an increase in capacity. And the way that we size that, that spiral reinforcement, it actually comes from uh, thin walled pressure vessel analogy uh, that you did in mechanics of deformable bodies. So basically what we do is we take the um, uh, the strength of that, that shell region, the 0.85 FC prime times uh, the the gross uh, times the quantity, the gross area minus the core area. So that's basically the strength of that, that shell region, that, that outer ring. And we set that equal to the spiral strength. And this 2 times the reinforcement ratio times the area times Fy. That basically comes from thin walled pressure vessels that you did uh, in mechanics of deformable bodies. And we set these two equal one another to equal to one another. And we solve for what is the reinforcement ratio? What is the rho for the spiral reinforcement? What is the rho required in order to provide enough spiral reinforcement to contain that, that shell region? Now when you do the math, uh, the actual algebra, and you, you simplify it, you get a constant 0.425 times the quantity that you see over here, and ACI says, ah, let's just keep it simple and round that up a bit. 
So ACI uses 0.45 times the quantity AG over AC minus 1 times the ratio that you see here uh, on the right. That's just the FC prime for the concrete and the FY for the, uh, for the steel. Um, the only thing that might be a little confusing on this is how do you actually compute a spiral reinforcement ratio? Like how do you compute rho for a spiral bar? Well, it's pretty straightforward. You just take the volume of the spiral within a given region and the volume of the core within a given region. So, so here I, over here on the right, I have you know sort of an image showing the spiral reinforcement. So within a given pitch of uh, that spiral, so you can see that spiral repeats every you know s distance up the column. Within one of those pitches, the volume of steel would be the area times that circumference, so pi times the di uh, diameter. So that's what you see here on the top of this equation. You have pi times the diameter, diameter, so that's the length, then times the area. So that'll tell you the volume of steel within a given pitch. And as for the volume of concrete within a given pitch, well, it's just pi d squared times the height, which is s. It's sort of like the volume of a cylinder. You know, what's the volume of a cylinder? It's the area times the height. So just do a little bit of algebra, plug and chug, and you'll get this expression for the, um, the reinforcement ratio for a spiral. Uh, it may seem like a lot, but don't worry. The, when we do example 18b, uh, I think you will find that this is, um, this is pretty straightforward. And with that, I'm actually going to go ahead and stop this video. Don't worry, uh, in our lecture on Monday, we're going to do these examples um, uh, uh, step by step. So you'll see all the ACI provisions, how they're computed, uh, and so on and so forth. All right, we'll see you on Monday. You'll have a great weekend.